Welcome back to part two of the pre-draft Pro Football Doc podcast. Special thanks to Jeff Benson, head man over in the sports book for Circa. Uh, it was a fun conversation. And uh, certainly uh, this right here is a little different atmosphere than where we recorded that. We would have done it out by the pool, stadium swim, but uh, it was a little hectic uh, to get in the podcast. Even the sports book was pretty uh, exciting. And uh, we did that on Saturday and we almost got to uh, see that uh, – horrific uh, UFC injury live. We'll get to that here uh, as we get to the video analysis portion of the podcast. But a uh, couple of things here with pre-draft and otherwise we'll talk about some stories, some breaking news here, as well as analyzing some video, including some other sports in terms of what's happening. What's happening with Tiger, uh, Tatis, uh, LeBron, but we will do a bunch of things here on this fun little segment here. The first thing related to the draft, though, is that, uh, you know, look, the medical information, for those who don't think it's important, Adam Schefter tweeted this morning, teams struggling to get accurate medical information on prospects due to absence of this year's combine. Even though there were medical exams in Indy this month given to 150 players, teams not pleased. There'll be last minute decisions based off medical info still trickling in. So what happened here was there was a, uh, and we talked about it at OutKick uh, two months ago, no medical combines whatsoever, no ability to examine all the players. But the typical at the recheck was to bring in 40, 50 guys that had current medical issues. Like a Trevor Lawrence, because he's still coming off left shoulder labral repair surgery. Now, Trevor didn't go because he got married that weekend. We got that. Jacksonville is still going to take him. But rechecks. And then they also invited the likely day one and day two picks. So day one is Thursday, round one. Day two is Friday, round two and three. 32 times three, obviously 96. So they invited about 100 guys, extra guys. So the team's got to look at the top three, but it was one doctor and one athletic trainer from each club. Normally there's a handful of doctors and a handful of athletic trainers. Let me tell you, it's pretty hard if you see 150 people and that exam happened across two days. Uh, imagine that your head spins if you're trying to see 75 guys a day and be careful with them on evaluation. That doesn't leave a lot of time for a club that's going to rely on what the team doctor or athletic trainer says, I mean, do the math. Uh, could you really afford to spend five minutes a player? Five minutes a player, assuming that includes looking at his records and examining the player. Five minutes, that's 12 an hour. To get to 75, that's already six plus solid hours of work and what about the documentation of what you're going to say about them? Let's say it took you five minutes to examine the player, five minutes to have looked at his records and to review records or MRI and, and to document the information. That's 10 minutes. 10 minutes times 72 players. That is a long, long head spinning day. So I think that's what Adam Schefter is talking about that even though they got to see the players, even the top three rounds, that was a whirlwind. That's like uh, trying to scout all the players across the weekend, right? I mean, or scout all first round picks across the weekend. That's a tough task. So even though 150 showed up, I think that's what Adam was talking about. And what we have going here at profootballdoc.com is I wanted to share with you First of all, what we have is that we talked about it. We talked about, for example, some of the specific issues. And for anyone who wants to join in, go to profootballdoc.com. It's free. Hit this download free now button right here in the green. And it'll give you our entire 2021 NFL draft injury preview for free. You'll see the biggest problems. You'll feel our biggest, see our biggest worries. And we'll talk about some of them. Well, you'll see all of it. 
you'll see this too, this OutKick article. We talked about the quarterback and their medical issues. For example, Justin Fields. There's talk that he's dropping, right? The 49ers are not going to take him at number three. But it's not because of the epilepsy. It's not because of the rib and hip pointer issue. Medically, he's fine. Mac Jones, he had an MRI of his elbow. If you go to the YouTube channel, Pro Football Doc, and subscribe, you'll see all the videos there, and I'll tweet those links too. You'll see what my concern is on Mac Jones. I mean, he had a throwing elbow MRI. Why? Um, is it potential long-term Tommy John issue? Who knows? Trevor Lawrence, he doesn't pass a physical today, but he should be fine because it's his non-throwing shoulder. I'm sure Jacksonville is still taking him. Trey Lance had a surgery where he was on crutches. Not a lot of information, but seems to be okay. Kyle Trask should not really drop. He had fifth metatarsal stress fractures and maybe a high ankle sprain. He should be fine by the time the season rolls around. I don't think he's going to drop medically. And I talked about this morning on Sports Grid how maybe over five and a half quarterback picks is the right number on the draft. And this goes along what we talked about with Jeff Benson. Look, uh, even if the teams at number 30, 31, 32, although the Chiefs already traded their pick, and they traded it to the Ravens, but maybe the Ravens will trade out. Remember, there's usually a flurry of activity at the bottom of the first round. Why? Especially for a quarterback. Why? Because you get that fifth year at a guaranteed price. So uh, and there might be over five and a half on number of quarterbacks selected. And that sixth one might be Kyle Trask. And medically, he is okay. But go to profootballdoc.com and download the free report to get all the injury information. I'm not trying to bore you with all the details, but it just so happens right at the top, Caleb Farley and Jalen Phillips are two of the ones that I'm most worried about. Caleb Farley has had a second low back surgery. He is not ready to play right now. We'll be ready by the time the season rolls around. But if a team has Patrick Sertain and Caleb Farley rated the same in terms of skills, in terms of a scouting football perspective, who's going to go first? Patrick Sertain. Caleb Farley's risk is recurrent low back issues. Not necessarily right now. He's had a good second surgery, but he's once you have two back surgeries at two different levels, admittedly, that third level is likely to crop up. And uh, will he have as long a career? Well, there's risk. So Caleb Farley, who I think was the consensus first DB to be chosen, now is likely to drop some. But you go to profootballdoc.com to see that. Jalen Phillips, edge rusher, Miami. He retired from UCLA because of three concussions in one year. And let's say that those concussion issues are behind you. And we know that, look, all of these guys, I hope get drafted where they get drafted. And believe me, none of my information is going to influence a team doctor. None of my information is going to influence a team. Why? Because they're looking at them. They know what the deal is. I'll digress a little bit. I remember a handful of years ago, Jalen Smith the now Cowboys linebacker, with his horrific multi-ligament knee injury, he tweeted a picture of himself going through the weight room saying, five weeks and I'm out of my knee brace. I almost didn't retweet the picture, but I did because he put it up on social media himself. It's not quite the same as when I was in Miami and I saw Tua Tagovailoa, who was still recovering from his hip at the time, I saw him limping as he was walking down the street a little bit. To, for me to video that and show that, I think would have been very unfair and unfair to the kid. Even then, though, though teams would have ultimately been able to examine him. For Jalen Smith, he put out the video himself. So it was, I thought it was fair for me to say, yeah, but look at that ankle foot orthosis, AFO, indicating the nerve problem, the nerve problem in his foot. And there was an article that I remember was written saying, oh, uh, that I might have cost him millions of dollars. 
So not true. First of all, the Cowboys still took him in the second round. Secondly, nobody in the NFL looks at my tweet or any tweet or any media person's information and then changes their opinion. You've got to look at him yourself. Why would you need my advice from a far away? And the next day, all the teams were going to examine Jalen Smith. They were going to see the foot drop. So I say that because I don't want anyone to think that I'm trying to rain on Caleb Farley's parade or Jalen Phillips parade. Teams already know this. Okay. But Jalen Phillips, my worry is not just the three concussions that caused him to temporarily retire from football. Let's say the concussion issues are completely behind him. And are concussion issues really fully behind you, right? I mean, once you have them, you're more prone. And, you know, I'm just an orthopedist, but as the head team physician, I dealt with it frequently. The issue with Jalen Phillips, though, is also he's got the hand issue, not just the head issue. He had a bad wrist injury where he was reported to have a proximal row carpectomy. You have eight bones in the base of your hand. You're removing at least three of them when you have a proximal row carpectomy. Look, I, I get it. You can be an edge rusher still. Uh, look, JPP lost most of his hand, his thumb, and the only you know two fingers left from the fireworks accident. And he won a Super Bowl in, this year, and he's still playing well. He probably would play better if he had his, you know, uh, normal uh, extremity situation. But here's my concern about Jalen Phillips, and teams know it too. First of all, as he's asked to jump to a higher level, is he going to be able to do all the weight training? I mean, with the proximal row carpectomy. Yes, you can play a rusher with a cast, but you're not as good. I'm not saying he's going to need a cast, but you get the idea. Can he adapt with a hands-free workout and still get all the strength training he needs? Maybe, but that's an issue. But if he's always a little weaker on the one side, are you going to able to put that edge rusher on either side of the field? You always want a strong outside hand if you're an edge rusher to contain the edge. Will that happen in Jalen Phillips' situation? So those are some of my worries and what team physicians will uh, go through. Go to profootballdoc.com and uh, take a look at the information, download the draft information for you. Next up here, uh, let's talk about the draft. I get asked a lot. This was kind of funny, brought back some memories. Chargers Giants, 17 years ago was the trade. I was lucky enough to be in the draft room. I've talked about it before at the kids table in the corner. In the main draft room, that's like, uh, Thanksgiving dinner, only the only grandma, grandpa, and the parents sat at the dining room table. Everyone else is in the living room or in the kitchen or on the back patio or the family room. The only coach that's in the room for us, the Chargers over the years, was the head coach. The coordinators were in their offices. All the position coach were in their offices. In the main room, the GM, assistant GM, the owner, the head coach, logistics guy, Ed McGuire, executive vice president, limited no more than 10 people. Head athletic trainer James Collins and I were sitting at the little round table in the corner. I call it the kids table. And uh, so we didn't hear all the conversations at the main table, but at least we were in the room. And uh, I was there when we drafted Eli Manning first pick. One of the reasons we did is who was drafting second? The Raiders. So, and Robert Gallery ended up being the second pick. And if we didn't take Eli, were we willing to cede Eli to the Raiders? In any case, we chose Eli. And let me tell you, the trade wasn't done until the Giants selected at number four, Philip Rivers. We didn't know the trade was done. How did I know the trade were done? done? I, I wasn't involved in any of the conversations for the trade, but the room visibly cheered and audibly cheered, and there were fist pumps the second Philip Rivers was selected at four because the Giants knew that's who we wanted. And so once they chose Rivers, our table, the head table, knew that the trade was coming. Literally, there were fist pumps, and then the phone rang, and it was the Giants saying, okay, let's do the deal. 
this whole tweet though was a fake thing um there was a fake tweet that the Chargers and giants uh, had a trade there was no trade this morning at all uh, the Chargers at 13 and the giants at 11. Uh, the only way you trade anyways is maybe when the giants are on the clock or right before it when you make sure you knew your guy but in any case no trade but that brought up a fun story and uh Next up, we'll talk a little bit about Alex Smith. My hat's off to him. He retired. You guys have heard me talk about his 17 surgeries and how he was less than 100% and the whole deal. But Alex Smith, I guess, in an SI interview, found it patronizing how Washington coaches were worried about him. Let me tell you, I love Alex Smith and what he's done. Name it the Comeback Player of the Year award. But there's no way Ron Rivera was patronizing to Alex Smith. He is a player's guy. He's an ex-player himself. He was concerned, that's for sure. Why? Alex Smith was not 100%. Now, I've said his leg will be fine. He's not going to risk losing his leg if he gets tackled. But his escapability wasn't there. And that may be the bigger issue. So good thing for Alex He's retired. He's done everything he can and wants to do. He should enjoy his wife, his family, his kids. And look, he brought helped lead the Washington football team to the playoffs. So kudos to him, comeback player of the year. A couple other fun things, and then we will get to um, a couple of the video review things, and we'll wind up. Next up, I saw this, and I love it because it brought back childhood memories but also made me feel really old. How many people have seen this before? Dodger Stadium. I grew up in LA. So suffice it to say, um, let me turn that off here. Suffice it to say, uh, I was young at the time, um, grade school age. I still remember that play. I thought, and and uh, it was tweeted out 45 days, 45 years ago today. So let's just say I was in preschool. No, not quite. That's great school. Um, but I still remember Rick Monday making that play. And I thought it was really cool at the time. And I thought, you know, it was a cool anniversary. So I would share it with you guys. And since we're talking uh, baseball, I got to give a shout out. Some of you guys see that Dodgers Padres series. Like I grew up in LA. I was a Dodger fan growing up, but I live in San Diego, clearly rooting for the Padres. What a great series, right? Extra inning games. You had all the drama. Tatis, five home runs. Are you kidding me? Tatis with five home runs in that series? That is just crazy. But take a look at this. So he had five home runs in the, in the four-game series. The Padres won three out of four. He just came back from a short stint on DL. I'm on record saying he's going to need shoulder labral repair surgery on his left shoulder. I'm on record saying it. It's a matter of when, not if. But so far, what an unbelievable job. Literally in 10 days, a 10-day IL stint, he changed his swing. He used to follow through and take his top hand off the bat. Now watch. Out of the third. Fernando Tatis Jr., welcome to Dodger Stadium. Out of the yard of the pavilion to put the pot. The top hand stays on now, the right hand. So it shortens the follow through, saving the left shoulder. I mean, to me, that's the quarterback changing his throwing motion in some ways. And he's still got power. I really hope he can continue. He's still going to need surgery. But uh, so far, Padres are proven they made the right decision. And I just wanted to point that out. A great job by Tatis. 
Let's move on. Uh, there was some news about Tiger. It's good to see him with a smile on his face. But here's Tiger with man's best friend. And he's pretty much saying that uh, the golf course is coming along faster than he is. And uh, he's still on crutches. By the way that he's standing and using the crutches, he's at no more than what we call toe touch weight bearing. So he's got a long ways to go. And uh, he's being honest here. I mean, it fits with what we said all along. He's not playing golf in 2021. Let's hope for 2022. And then uh, next up here, let's talk about LeBron. And then we'll finish off with uh, some avert your eyes video, look away UFC video. But here we go with uh, LeBron. When is he coming back from his high ankle sprain? Well, here he is at his workout. And you can see he doesn't really stick that right foot into the ground hard. And he's a little bit flat footed. But also tell me which thigh is bigger, his right or left. Look closely as he comes towards you and away from you. Less obvious here, slight hitch on his gait on his right. Doesn't make any, does, and this is just warm up, right? Look at the right thigh versus the left side thigh. LeBron's not there yet, in my opinion. Now, maybe that was just warm up and he's going to do a lot more, but I think he's still a little bit away from being anywhere near 100%. Finally, let's talk about UFC, UFC 163, Chris Weedman. This is really pretty crazy story here. And we've got some video for you here. Let me get to it. So gruesome USC injury here. And uh, we talk about it, but I'll show you the video here. Uh, first of all, as we get to it, uh, don't watch what happens at the end here if you are at all squeamish. Watch this. He checks it. Oh, my let me, let me go backwards here. I skipped too far forward. My bad. That was actually, um, here, we'll pause it here. This is Chris Weedman kicks and watch what happens at the end. If you're scream, squeamish, look away. That's bad enough. You can see there's an extra joint at his shin. You'll see it more here, but look away again. He even stands on it. I mean, craziness. Tib and fibula fracture. The crazy thing is there have been three of these in the history of the UFC. And one of them was eight years ago involving Chris Weedman. This is Anderson Silva. This is Chris Weedman. Suffice it to say, three in the history of UFC, and two of them involve Chris Weedman. The good news is Anderson Silva returned and finished his UFC career in the octagon, even though he was older. Chris Weedman... This is not gonna be an Alex Smith injury. There won't be infection. He'll get a rod in his tibia, he already has. He'll be back six, nine months or so. Back to pretty close the same. So as gruesome as it was, thankfully um, in the end, it really should be a good result. And I didn't mean to gross anyone out with that video, but uh, thought it was worth uh, analyzing there. As long as he doesn't get a compartment syndrome, there's no artery nerve issue. He really has an excellent chance of a full return, just like Anderson Silva did. Heck, Paul George had one of these, uh, et cetera. Uh, anyways, um, that's the Pro Football Doc podcast pre-draft. Go to profootballdoc.com, download the draft preview. We'll be doing things all week. Go to the YouTube channel. We have some vi videos up analyzing the quarterbacks. We'll have more. We'll have more stuff on OutKick. Give us a nice rating on Apple or whatever for wherever you listen to podcasts. 
Thanks for watching and listening Pro Football Doc Podcast, end of part two. And thanks again to Circa and Jeff Benson for being our guest this week. Uh, see you next week.